Hello and welcome to this special update on a geologic event that took place today. Today is Friday, April 5th, and I am geology professor Sean Wilsey. This morning at about 8.23 local time, Eastern Daylight Time, we had an earthquake. And this earthquake's notable because not so much its size or magnitude, but because it was felt over such a large area by so many people. And so it's gonna be in the news. You're probably gonna see it. Maybe some of you actually felt it, uh, but I received a lot of emails from folks. And so I thought I'd jump on, provide a little bit of an uh, update and analysis on this earthquake, maybe give you some insights and some things perhaps you didn't know and just share with you what I can about this earthquake. So let's start with our seismic map for today. And so here is the earthquake's location. It actually occurred in New Jersey, a little bit west of New York City, but as many of you know, this is a, a large metro area. So just, I guess, north uh, east of the town of Lebanon. So here's the epicenter here, this orange dot. Uh, maybe going in a satellite view, you can see just how densely populated this region is here off to the east where we have New York City and Newark and some of these bigger communities here. Let's dive into the USGS data associated with this. Now, first of all, the good news is we have had no reports of damage or injuries so far, but it was widely felt. So a lot of people uh, were up and going and felt this earthquake, and that's why it's going to be, especially in the US, such a news item, at least for maybe a day or two. So we'll hope that that trend continues where there's no reports of damage or any uh, injuries and, and I would expect as such with an earthquake of this size and in this location I wouldn't expect there to be any reports of, of any major or substantial damage. So um, the earthquake was at about five kilometers depth so about three miles down a very shallow earthquake and like we said before it was magnitude 4.8 so you can see here on the USGS website that the um, you know, estimated fatalities, very low, probably near zero. Economic loss should be quite low as well. The thing we'll look for possibly moving forward are aftershocks. We might be seeing a few aftershocks in the maybe three, maybe four range, although they're more likely to be much smaller uh, than that as we move forward. Um, the most interesting thing I think on this that I found was going into uh, the shake map or let me actually go back out. Let's go to uh, this Did You Feel It site. So as some of you may know, when you actually feel an earthquake, especially if you're based in the US, you can get on the USGS website, answer a pretty simple survey with some questions about how you experience the earthquake. And then all that information is aggregated and put into this database. So you can see here, there's been over 130,000 responses um, from people living in the greater New York City area, uh, depending on their location. And this map plots up those responses, aggregates them all, um, and then plots up what we call the modified Mercalli intensity scale. So it's a little bit different than magnitude. The magnitude tells us how much energy was released at the point where the earthquake occurred in the ground. The intensity level is a different way to measure the earthquake, and it tells us a little bit about how the earthquake's shaking uh, was manifested at the surface, because earthquakes might behave differently depending on the rocks they're going through. You can experience earthquakes differently depending on the type of building that you're in, and the damage, of course, can vary as well depending depending on some of those factors. So subsurface geology, building construction styles, building materials, all those things will factor into this. So it looks like based on the shade of green we see near the epicentral area there, that this, the intensity level approached maybe up to magnet, uh, intensity level six. We use Roman numerals for our Mercalli intensity scale, just to keep it separate uh, from magnitude, which is a, a numeric scale. So you can see here shaking, um, sort of in the moderate to maybe almost strong category, but damage would be very light to light. So people definitely would have felt this earthquake um, almost across the board, unless you were maybe, I don't know, running on a treadmill or doing something very active or, or sleeping quite soundly. But people definitely in this area, millions of people likely felt this earthquake, uh, but thankfully the damage was quite small. So this number is likely to go up as more people jump on here and uh, report how, how they felt the earthquake. Notice over here towards New York, we have a little different shade of blue here, and that's more down towards the light shaking category. So it's just around this epicentral area where we had our strongest intensity level of about Roman numeral six or so. Uh, one way to look at how that earthquake might have manifested itself is with this uh, website here, this 
location on YouTube, and I have permission from the owner. Uh, this is called Earthquake Sim, and this person has done a great job of taking computer graphics and basically animating earthquakes of different intensity levels to give you an idea of how much shaking might occur. So I chose intensity level six because that's the maximum intensity level that we seem to have had from this earthquake near the epicenter in New Jersey. So this is not necessarily the way it might have looked in New York City, but perhaps how it looked like, what it would have looked like uh, closer to the epicenter. So I just want to show you this short little animation here. So you can see the amount of shaking in this office building here, maybe a few speakers falling over, a couple things falling over, uh, but that's kind of it there. I'll, maybe I'll show that one more time just so you can see. Uh, let's find six again. Oh, we're going to go back a little further. Here we go. So here is uh, intensity level six. You know, things would sway, things would shake, but, you know, the ceiling's not collapsing. There's not wholesale uh, destruction on any level. If you go to this, and I'll make sure I link this in my video description, if you go check out this YouTube channel, you can run through all the different simulations. You can see what it looks like when you get up to, you know, intensity level, uh, you know, 11, like where things are really bad, um, and check that out if you want to. But I wanted to give you a little view of how that might have looked uh, in the epicentral area. If we take it down to maybe, now the interesting thing here is I don't know how well this takes into account, like uh, heights of buildings and skyscrapers in New York City, where the intensity level would have been something like this, maybe intensity level three or four. Um, there's lots of other factors that go into how the earthquake is perceived and how it feels to you as individuals. So, uh, but at any, at any rate, intensity level three or four is usually felt by most people. So, uh, so that's a fun little way to look at how uh, big the earthquake might have been. Um, let's go back here to some other information from the USGS. If we come over here to all our fault plane solution or what's known as a moment tensor solution, some of you like to call these beach balls. This basically is a plot taking the seismic data. We are able to model the trend or strike of the fault that produced the earthquake and uh, also what kind of fault produce the earthquake. So based on this little beach ball here, and I'm not going to go into how we read these, I'll try to do that in a future video. This earthquake was produced by a reverse fault, so a compressional fault as the rocks are being pushed together um, and one side is riding up over the top of each other. That's a reverse fault, but it also has a little bit of a strike slip component. So it's not only a compressional fault, but it's moving the rocks a little bit sideways. So this is what we would call a reverse oblique fault, either with a northwest-southeast trend or strike to it, or a north-south strike to it. Usually the way this works is the, the fault plane solution gives us two possible fault planes, two different directions or two, two faults it could be, not in terms of how the rock shifted, but in terms of the direction the fault runs across the landscape. Uh, and then usually we can verify that by looking at what makes the most sense based on the tectonic setting or if there's maps of other known faults in the area. Um, and so that's the type of fault that produced the earthquake we had this morning in this greater New York area. So let's look at why this earthquake even happened. Um, why did we have an earthquake in New Jersey and the New York City area, which seems to be quite outside the norm of what we think of when we typically consider earthquakes in the United States? So here's the USGS hazard map, and this was just updated, I think, within the last year or so. And you can see with the colors here, the hazard level increases from the blues to the greens yellow, orange, red, and kind of fuchsia there. And a lot of this map should make sense to most of you. Highest, a high earthquake hazard along the West Coast, stretching from uh, Seattle and the Puget Sound, all the way down along the Oregon coast, through San Francisco, and then going into the San Andreas system through Southern California. So this is our active plate boundary on the West Coast. That should make sense why there's a high earthquake hazard there. Um, we have other regions of the West, like the Intermountain Seismic Belt, which runs from Montana through Yellowstone, down through Salt Lake City, and even kind of extends down towards southwestern Utah and towards Las Vegas. Um, but then there's these anomalous areas in the East Coast where there are relatively high earthquake hazards that just don't seem to make much sense. And we're not going to spend too much time looking at, at these 
in this video. Uh, there was an 1883 earthquake here in South Carolina near Charleston. Uh, there was the 1811 to 1812 series of earthquakes on the New Madrid seismic zone here near Memphis, Tennessee and on the Mississippi River. So these have had historic earthquakes in the past and that's why they continue to be rated as having a high hazard. Um, but you can see that the greater New York area and northern New Jersey is not immune to earthquakes based on this map. It has a moderate uh, seismic hazard level when it comes to earthquakes. Uh, and so if we look at just the a seismic hazard map for the state of New Jersey, and here's New York City here, our earthquake today occurred right about here between Somerset and Hunterdon County. It's right near the county line, more or less. But you can see that there's at least a significant seismic hazard even within the state of New Jersey, especially in the northern part of the state. And that decreases as you move towards uh, the southern part of the state. So why, why did we have an earthquake here and let's maybe spend a minute talking about earthquakes in the eastern U.S. versus the western U.S. because this is an important point to make. The earthquake we had today in New York City <clears throat> was felt in Philadelphia. Uh, it was likely felt in Washington, D.C. I haven't looked at all the reports of how widespread it was felt, but it's likely it was felt over a substantial region. This is obviously a densely populated area, so if you have more people in a region, you're going to have more reports of that earthquake being felt. But the second reason why this earthquake is going to be so widely uh, noted is that the rocks that the, the seismic waves are traveling through here in the eastern U.S. for the most part are very dense. They're very old rocks. They're very cold in terms of their temperature. This part of the U.S. is no longer on or near a plate boundary. It's nowhere near any sort of volcanoes. And so the rocks here being old and very dense tend to transmit that seismic energy much more efficiently than if we have an earthquake in the west. Here in the west, the rocks are younger typically. They're much warmer or hotter, if you will, because of the recent uh, uh, volcanic activity and geologic activity along this plate boundary. And so the point is, is that earthquakes of a same size, let's say of a magnitude four earthquake on the East Coast, that might be felt over a 100 kilometer or 60 mile radius. Um, if you take that same magnitude four quake and bring it over here to the Western US, uh, it might only be felt over maybe 20 kilometers, like 15 miles, something like that. And that's because as the seismic energy moves through these very warm rocks, it just dissipates the energy quite a bit. It's moving across these warmer rocks. It's moving across other faults, discontinuous belts of rock. There's a lot of different rock types on the West Coast, as opposed to the East Coast having more or less a uniform type of basement rocks, the rocks that sit at the lowest levels. And so that's some reasons why, even though we see far more earthquakes in terms of frequency on the West Coast, it's sometimes these East Coast quakes that you could make an argument that they're a little bit more of high consequences because if you if this earthquake had been a little bit bigger and more damaging, it would have been damaging over a large larger region. So an important point to note out and an important um, uh, important uh, distinction between East Coast earthquakes and West Coast earthquakes. Uh, this is just a simple map that shows historic seismicity in New Jersey. So since 1783, um, and of course we didn't have modern seismometers back then, so some of these are estimated earthquake magnitudes. But you can see the location of the quakes there. Again, our quake today has occurred right about here. So it's in a zone of not just uh, historic seismicity, but you know known quakes and fault lines. So this is an area that wasn't a surprise that today's earthquake is not a complete surprise, especially to the geologists that have focused on earthquakes and seismicity in this region. And so why, what exactly is going on here? Well, we'll have to wait for some more advanced analysis to come in, but I just pulled up a few things here and there is a known fault system. Uh, let me make this a little bit smaller here so we can get it all in that runs through this part of New Jersey. So again, today's earthquake is pretty close to where this red uh, line and this yellow line intersect. So this is the intersection of two mapped and known fault system systems, the Ramapo Fault and the Hopewell Fault. Based on the beach ball or the fo focal mechanism solution, I'm sort of trending towards it possibly being the Hopewell Fault because the orientation of that fault 
being kind of a north-south fault matches up a little bit better than the Ramapo fault, which runs more northeast-southwest. But we'll have to wait and see uh, once some analysis is done there. And so th one of these could have been the, the reason why we had the earthquake today. Now, these faults formed hundreds of millions of years ago when Africa collided with North America um, and then broke apart. So we had the huge supercontinent Pangaea and about 240 million years ago during the Triassic, it started to pull away. So basically Morocco, Northern Africa was sitting right here along the coast of the Eastern US. And as those two continent, continental blocks started to pull away from each other, it caused extension and large normal fault systems that broke away and produced weaknesses, faults through the crust that are still present today. So the reason we think we get earthquakes like this in the eastern US might be because even though this is not near the active plate boundary today, the plate boundary is over here, the whole continent is still moving. The rocks are still under stress as the, the continent and the nation drift slowly to the west or southwest. And as stresses accumulate in these rocks on the east coast, those stresses can be relieved along some of these old pre-existing fractures or faults. It's kind of like, you know, if you had like a crack in the frame of your car, uh, just a little micro fracture, but a weak point, and then you got into an accident, um, that fracture or crack in the frame of your car might be the point where something breaks or moves or shifts because it's, it's a weak zone. And we think these little kind of hot spots, if you will, in terms of seismicity on the East Coast are these areas where there's these old faults that have been reactivated as the whole continental block and plate uh, slides to the West. So we'll have to see as we move forward if this is the actual fault that produced uh, today's earthquake, but it's likely to be one of these or some part of this system here that actually produced uh, this earthquake here. It's hard to, for us to actually look at these faults and um, analyze them in these urban settings. Um, now this epicenter here might not be as bad because it's actually you know in not not as close to the densely populated urban area but in order to study the fault we have to be able to see it um, or detect it either see it on the surface image it somehow or detect it in the subsurface and that can becomes very tricky when you're dealing with densely populated urban areas such as we have over here near new york city um, sometimes it takes the earthquake to tell us where the fault is. And I don't think that'll be the case here. I think this will end up being on one of those known and mapped faults, but we'll have to see how this looks moving forward. I did see one uh, previously published study on the Ramapo fault that suggests it's possible that it could produce magnitude six or possibly even a little bit greater earthquakes. And had today's earthquake been in, in that sort of ballpark of a magnitude six, um, it would have been much worse. Like we might have had some casualties or injuries. We might be looking at more substantial damage. But uh, if nothing else, this is probably a good warning shot across the bow for this part of the country that may be a little bit complacent and uh, in terms of earthquakes to realize that they have an actual uh, earthquake zone in this region and that this is an area of known seismicity. So we'll see how things look moving forward. Looks like so, while we were talking here, uh, maybe one little um, aftershock might have popped up here. I'll have to look at the time on that one. Um, yeah, maybe that was about an hour ago. So anyway, but we'll have to see moving forward. But uh, nonetheless, an exciting morning in the New York City area and in New Jersey. And as a final thing here, as I wrap up this update, which I hope you've enjoyed, um, there's a viewer that is a meteorologist in this area whose name is Ariel Shobbs, and he is, had a birthday yesterday. So I wanted to give him a shout out. Happy birthday yesterday on April 4th. Hope you're enjoying your day today. And for the rest of us, um, thanks for again for joining me on this quick little update on this New York area earthquake for Friday, April 5th. Thanks again for all your support, and we'll see you next time. Take care.